God gives keys to recognizing his kingdom through the resurrection? Absolutely true. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. My name is Rod Hembert. And I'm Janice. And this is Bible Discovery TV. We are going through the Bible today in the book of Mark. This is amazing. Ryan is here. Corey's off, but Ryan is here. Ryan, what's going on? All right, well, today my segment's all about John. He was a prominent disciple of Jesus, and he is believed to have written the Gospel of John. Excellent. Janice? I want to talk about harsh words. Okay, very good. And we also have a good friend of mine. It is Jim Canalon. He's our guest. How are you, Jim? Terrific. It's so good to be here, Rod. And uh, where, where, in, where in Mark are we? Yes, we're in Mark. We're in Mark chapter 9. Mark so chapter you 9. You, uh, you guys are so fast. <laughs> <laughs> okay, now I've caught up. All right. Oh, this is this is the chapter of the Transfiguration. Yes, exactly. Are, so, you, are you dealing with that? We're, we're dealing with some of that. But right now, <laughs> get your Bible out and uh, let's look at what God is saying. Mark 7, 24 through 37. From there he arose and went to the region of Tyre and Sidon. And he entered a house and wanted no one to know it, but he could not be hidden. For a woman whose young daughter had an unclean spirit heard about him, and she came and fell at his feet. The woman was a Greek, a Syrophoenician by birth, and she kept asking him to cast the demon out of her daughter. But Jesus said to her, let the children be filled first, for it is not good to take the children's bread and throw it to the little dogs. And she answered and said to him, Yes, Lord, even the little dogs under the table eat from the children's crumbs. Then he said to her, For this saying go your way, the demon has gone out of your daughter. And when she had come to her house, she found the demon gone out and her daughter lying on the bed. Again, departing from the region of Tyre and Sidon, he came through the midst of the region of Decapolis to the Sea of Galilee. Then they brought him, one who was deaf and had an impediment in his speech, and they begged him to put his hand on him. And he took him aside from the multitude and put his fingers in his ears, and he spat and touched his tongue. Then looking up to heaven, he sighed and said to him, Ephephtha, that is, be opened. Immediately his ears were opened, and the impediment of his tongue was loosed, and he spoke plainly. Then he commanded them that they should tell no one but the more he commanded them, the more widely they proclaimed it. And they were astonished beyond measure, saying, He has done all things well. He makes both the deaf to hear and the mute to speak. Mark chapter 7, verses 24 through 37. Mark chapter 7 and 8. That's what we study as we continue going through the Bible. Thanks for joining us. Rod Hember here and Bible Discovery TV continues this trek through God's wonderful word. Jesus Christ came to be among us in a unique and unusual way. He was born into a family of low influence, not having economic power or priestly respect. God's plan was that his only begotten son be born of a virgin through the Holy Spirit. He was fully man and fully God. Now, as Jesus began his ministry, the uniqueness of his teaching and miracles were evident to all who were around him. As the word spread about Jesus, multitudes of people would come to hear his teachings and they would bring themselves and others to be healed by him. A Gentile woman, Gentile woman, not a Jewish, a Gentile woman came to Jesus and asked him to deliver her daughter from demonic forces. But Jesus replied to her, saying, Let the children be filled first, for it is not good to take the children's bread and throw it to the little dogs. Well, with that answer, many of us would have taken a hike, have gone away insulted and discouraged. 
Yet she persisted and she pushed back. She said, yes, Lord, but even the little dogs under the table eat from the children's crumbs. You know, it was because of her response that Jesus fulfilled her request. She didn't think of herself as some advanced person and the Jews were less and she was a great Gentile. She thought of herself as who she was. And she said, yes, Lord, but the truth is that I need you. I need you. Isn't that interesting? Well, today, take your Bible guide and turn with me to today's passage as we study this. If you don't have one, write or call for it or go to BibleDiscoveryTV.com where we have this program. You're probably watching it from there. Good to see you at Bible Discovery TV. Or you can watch it uh, many places, YouTube and all the places that we're on. But I would encourage you that you click on the Bible guide. It takes you to a page eventually where it downloads just like we print it. So you're seconds away from joining us. As we look at a mother's faith, how can a mother be so strong that God himself would change the direction? Well, God knew what was going to happen, and God shows us the truth about this. So this is fascinating. Father, today, as we look at this passage from the book of Mark, help us to hear what you're saying. So many times, Lord, we just give up or we turn away from you. But Father, I pray today in Jesus' name that we would listen and we would come back and that we would have faith in you in the name of Jesus Christ. And we all said together, amen. Make it so. All right, so let's go to Mark chapter 7. This is a great passage. We're going to go 20 verses down or 23 verses down. Let's join it at chapter 7, verse 24. It says, from there, Jesus arose and went to the region of Tyre and Sidon. Now, this is an interesting city. Tyre is an interesting region and Sidon is an interesting region. Very wealthy capital. And he entered a house and wanted no one to know it. But he could not be hidden. For a woman whose young daughter had an unclean spirit heard about him. And she came and fell at his feet. This guy's a Jew. Jesus is a Jew. The woman came and fell at his feet. What is that about? The woman was a Greek, a Syrophoenician by birth. And she kept asking him to cast the demon out of her daughter. But Jesus said to her, let the children be filled first, for it is not good to take the children's bread and throw it to the little dogs. And she answered and said to him, Yes, Lord, yet even the little dogs under the table eat from the children's crops. I want to tell you, this is amazing. You know, God's word always provokes a reaction and a response from us. God answers prayer thoughtfully, not simply. How many times have I said, This is a simple prayer, God, answer it? It's simple. But God answers prayer correctly. And there's no simple answer. And many times God begins a motion when we pray. He begins to stir things in a direction that go his way. Don't give up on praying. Like the woman who said, yes, Lord, but even the dogs eat the children's food. May we be persistent. Lord, heal that person. Lord, save that person. Don't give up. Keep praying, keep praying, keep praying. Very interesting, isn't it? Well, watch this now. Mark 7, 29. It says, then Jesus said to her, for this saying, go your way. The demon has gone out of your daughter. He did it. Isn't that something? And when she had come to her house, she found the demon gone out and her daughter was lying on the bed. Stunning. You see, Jesus responded to the woman by healing her daughter. The woman did not give up. Her request was deeply personal. Listen to me. This woman knew she was a Syrophoenician. She was probably, you know, I mean, the Jews were not looked on favorably by them and all of that. And yet she goes to this Jewish man who she knows has the power of God. 
And she says, Lord, heal my daughter because her daughter was tormented by that demonic force. And the Jewish man says to her, it's not right for me to give to the dogs food from the table. And she responds to him. And he says, because you responded this way, I'm not even going to have to go there. It's done. She went back and it was done. Incredible. That's how God speaks. Let's go on to 7 verse 31. Again, departing from the region of Tyre and Sidon, he came through the midst of the region of Decapolis to the Sea of Galilee. Then they brought to him one who was deaf and had an impediment in his speech. And they begged him to put his hand on him. And he took him aside from the multitude and he put his finger in his ears and he spat and touched his tongue. And then he looked up to heaven. He sighed and said, Ephrathia, which is be opened. And immediately his ears were opened and the impediment of his tongue was loosed. And he spoke plainly. And then he commanded them that they should tell no one. But you know, the more he commanded them, the more they widely proclaimed it. And they were astonished beyond measure, saying, He has done all of these things well. He makes both deaf to hear and the mute to speak. Jesus did not come to build his popularity, beloved. But he came to heal and to help us. If we are open to him, Jesus shows us how to follow his will and his ways. Beloved, listen to me carefully. God will heal and help us if we allow him into our life to work in us. So, Father, we pray today, help us, Lord, in Jesus' name. And we said, all of us together, amen. This character of King Saul, this historical figure. Now, I think it's probably fair to say that most of us, uh, when we think of King Saul, we think of the bad guy foil to King David. But an entire book of the Bible is also dedicated to mostly his reign. Of course, that's 1 Samuel. So I'm really excited to jump into it today and see what we can learn about Saul. Well, it's time now to carry on with our Bible study, and my segment today is all about the Apostle John. And John is known famously as the disciple whom Jesus loved. And the biblical books of 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John, Revelation, and the Gospel bearing his name are all traditionally ascribed to him. So let's study the life and career of this beloved disciple of Christ. Though just a simple fisherman from Galilee, John was destined to become not only one of the twelve apostles of Jesus Christ, but also along with his brother James and Peter, a part of Christ's inner circle of disciples. In fact, Peter, James, and John were the closest friends of Jesus and thus witnessed events that the other disciples didn't, such as the raising of Jairus' daughter, the transfiguration, and Jesus' private prayer in the Garden of Gethsemane and it was John and Peter who were entrusted with preparing the Last Supper. Even after Jesus returned to heaven, these three continued in the ministry and became what Paul the Apostle described as pillars of the church. These three are also the only disciples who received new names from Jesus. Peter, or Cephas, was the name Jesus gave to this disciple who was formerly called Simon. And John and James he nicknamed Bonarges, meaning sons of thunder, possibly referring to their overly bold and impulsive style. On one occasion, quips author Stephen Miller, when the Samaritans refused to welcome Jesus and his entourage into their city, the brothers sounded a bit like they had a hotline to lightning. Should we order down fire from heaven to burn them up? Another time, John ordered a man exercising demons in Jesus' name to stop because he wasn't one of the twelve disciples and they even had the audacity to ask to sit on Jesus' right and left side in his coming kingdom. However, as his relationship with Jesus matured, so too did his spiritual life, so that the John we see in latter times is nothing like the impulsive and impetuous John of former times. In fact, out of all the disciples, John seems to have held a particularly special place in Jesus' heart. Tradition says that John wasn't just one of the three inner circle disciples, but was the beloved disciple of Christ. 
for it was to this man rather than to his own brothers that Jesus entrusted his mother Mary. Only one other person in the entire Bible was considered beloved of God, and that was Daniel. Is it any coincidence then that these two men are the greatest sources of prophetic revelation in the Bible? Indeed, the book of Revelation, as well as 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John, and the gospel bearing his name, are all traditionally ascribed to him. Tradition also claims that John was the only disciple who didn't die a martyr's death. Apparently, he left Jerusalem around AD 65 for Ephesus, where he wrote the fourth gospel and the three epistles. Later, he was exiled to the island of Patmos, where he penned Revelation. After his release, he apparently returned to Ephesus, where he died peacefully at a ripe old age. Truly, he was beloved of God. Like all of us, John was a human and so he had his downfalls, but ultimately he was loyal and was one of Jesus Christ's closest friends and would be later described by Paul the Apostle as one of the pillars of the church. And in case you missed it, something else I pointed out in the segment was that both John and the Old Testament prophet Daniel were called greatly beloved of God. It's, an inter it's interesting then that these two are also the two greatest sources of prophetic revelation in the Bible. It seems because of their faithfulness and obedience, God disclosed revelation to them, not given to any others. And just think about this as well. Through these beloved men of God, the Lord has disclosed this information to us as well. So we as believers and followers of Christ are also the friends of God. What a comforting thought. Yeah, that, that, that is a comforting thought. And the idea that Jesus Christ would call us friends, it really brings a change to what they thought. You know, they didn't think like we think today. So that's very interesting, mm -hmm. Ryan. Thank you. Janice? Well, we have a friend here too in Corey's absence as she's on maternity leave. And Jim, I always love when, when you can just comment on some of the things that I'm talking about mm -hmm. because you add such a, a dimension and a depth to the scriptures, which you do on your program, Jim Candle on Today, which we very much appreciate because mm -hmm. we go through here so quickly sometimes that we don't even talk about the right days that we're doing because we're so fast. <laughs> like I said, Mark 9 at the opener. <laughs> and we're right? actually in Mark, Mark 7. 7. That's okay. I, 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 didn't, I didn't know the difference. So, <laughs> so here we are in Mark chapter 7. And I every time I come here, my heart just hurts a little bit for this mother. And it's, um, you know, the day in the Bible guide is called a mother's faith. And we see this Syrophoenician woman coming, a Gentile woman, somebody who's not Jewish. Hmm. And she's coming to Jesus because she has heard of the miracles that he's been doing all over the place. And she has a daughter with an unclean spirit, that what the Bible refers to as a demonic force that has that takes over her and she's ill. So this mother comes to Jesus and it says here in verse uh, 26, and she, she kept asking Jesus to cast the demon out of her daughter. But here's Jesus' reply to her. Here's what he says. Um, Let the children be filled first. For it is not good to take the children's bread and throw it to the little dogs. Now, I, I got to tell you, Jim, if, if that was me, I might have just said, oh, what? Like, don't you care? And I, turn I, I away and, 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 and walk away. I can help you with that when you're ready. All right. And so she answered. She came back. Here was what her answer to him. Yes, Lord, even the little dogs under the table eat from the children's crumbs. And then Jesus turns to her and he says, for this saying, go your way. The demon has gone out of your daughter. And and before you answer me here, Jim, mm. what I wanted to point out to people was sometimes the word of God, what we read in the Bible, seems harsh. We don't want to hear it. And 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 sometimes we turn away. Even when we read through the, the gospels, the scriptures here, we see that some of the words that Jesus said to the multitudes of people, a lot of them just said, you know what? I'm I'm out of here. I I, I don't, I'm not gonna follow this. And so but uh, the, this mother's persistence here mm -hmm. um, is really something. And, and, and it's true. We're going to read through the scriptures and there are going to be portions that are hard for us to deal with. Mm -hmm. But I think if our hearts remain open and we follow the Lord, um, we will learn more. So please okay. help, help expand on this a little bit more. Mark doesn't give details. Mark is so blunt. He, I mean, he's, so, you know, he's very Jewish the way he writes. He's just bang, bang, bang. You know, he doesn't embellish. He's not like Luke who writes this beautiful Greek. Mark writes Greek too, but he's just to the point, bullet point kind. He doesn't give you the detail. Like for instance, he said, Jesus left that place and went to the vicinity of Tyre. Hello? <laughs> what? what? Three-day walk? Tyre? Tyre is in Lebanon, hmm. okay? All the way up the upper Galilee. I mean, I've driven that so many times and I've spent time in Lebanon broadcasting, as you know. I know that area. I've been in Tyre. 
and Sidon. Uh, it's a huge journey. Mark just said, there, 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 there they go. Okay. So he enters the house, didn't want anyone to know it, yet he couldn't keep his presence secret. In fact, as soon as she heard about it, a woman whose little daughter was possessed by an impure pure, pure spirit came and fell at his feet. The woman was a Greek, born in Syrian Phoenicia. She knew that she was a dog. Because all Jews saw Gentiles as dogs. Okay. So she had this uh, unfair, unjust sense of who she was in the presence of Jewish people, and especially a Jewish man. Okay? And she has the temerity to approach this guy. She's heard about him. He's famous. He's a rock star. Everybody's heard about Jesus. And she, Mark doesn't give us the detail. She's all nervous. She probably went in backwards. She was so scared, you know. But she, her daughter, yes. this, this man can heal my daughter, okay? So she's so aware of her social status. I'm a dog in this guy's eyes, okay? So she finally approaches Jesus, and Jesus knows exactly what's going on. And so he, he plays to her sense of inferiority when he says, let the children eat all they want first. It's not right to take the children's bread and toss it to the dogs. In other words, I know what you're doing here, and I really admire it. You are a courageous woman. You've actually come to a Jewish man who sees you or who you think sees you as a dog, and you still had the courage to come and talk to me about it. So what he was doing is he was really, in a very interesting Middle Eastern way, complimenting her and saying, look, it's cool. You're not a dog, okay? And your, your little girl's going to be fine. Uh, so when you understand that, it helps you to, it sort of mitigates the, the bluntness of this. Because yes. essentially what he's doing is he's quoting uh, an aphorism or a parabolic statement that was very common, you know, in, in the culture, mm -hmm. both Jew and Gentile. And there was uh, no doubt that Jesus uh, saw beyond that and saw into her heart and, and healed her daughter. So, you know, it's a great story. As I, when I understand it from a, a cultural context. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Right. And that's so key. See, the cultural context, um, uh, you, you know, study really helps you with, cult, with context. You guys are doing it all the time, so you understand context. Context, context, context. Never, never, you know, close your eyes and point and get God's word for you today. And Judas went and hanged himself. <laughs> oh, that can't be God's word for me today. <laughs> Go and do thou likewise. <laughs> you know, I mean, you, you can't study the scripture that way. Mm -hmm. You have to have context. And when you have historical context, when you have doctrinal context, when you have uh, 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 rightly dividing the word of truth, as Paul says to Timothy, okay, here's what it says in Genesis, here's what it says in, in Acts, uh, here's what it says over in Zephaniah, uh, rightly divide, context, context. And, and when you then have a sense of historical and social and cultural context, which unfortunately, or fortunately, I have a bit of an advantage there because I lived there for seven years, you know. And a lot of my best friends were rabbis, and I, I interacted with rabbis a lot when I was pastoring in Jerusalem. When you begin to see into the, the, the Jewish or the Israeli contextual view of history and God and, and the law, and, and, and you remember that Jesus was Jewish, the Gentiles were Jewish. I, I should say the Gentiles. <laughs> the, the disciples were Jewish, yeah. okay? Okay. Um, and all the early believers were Jews. I remember one time I was pointing this out, I was preaching somewhere back when I was in Jerusalem, I was itinerating somewhere in the States, and I talked about Jesus being Jewish. Afterwards, this woman came, Jesus was not Jewish, Jesus was Christian. Like She was really offended by me, you know? And I said, um, hello? <laughs> Maybe you're new? Uh, Jesus was a Jew. And where would we be without the Jewish scriptures, right? Yes. Where, where would we be without the Jewish scriptures? We're rooted in the Jewish scriptures. Mm -hmm. It's absolutely the foundation of our faith. We're talking about the Jewish Messiah here. And what are we Gentiles doing about talking about a Jewish Messiah? This is the big issue in the early church. Jesus has no relevance for Gentiles. Mm -hmm. But Paul and Barnabas said, no, he does. And Peter said, yeah. I got to agree. The Lord showed me that, you know, in Jaffa, and I went up to Caesarea, and boy, you, would, you should see what God did in Cornelius' household. He even baptized them in the Holy Spirit. I mean, we can't get around it. God loves Gentiles. Yeah. 
<laughs> and, and thank and if, God that he does. Yeah, if well. you want to know more about Jim, Jim yeah. Cantillon today is the program, but he published a book called Cantillon's Casual Comedy. Oh, you should mention that. Well, there you go. Jesus there you Christ, go. who has a, has a uh, iPad on the front of it. Uh, so take a look at it, Jim. Where can they get it? Yeah, you, you can. Uh, it's called Cantillon's Casual Commentary, a 21st Century Guide to the Life of Jesus for the Internet Generation. Um, it's 520 pages, hardcover. It's also available in softcover and ebook. Amazon has it. Barnes & Noble has it. Pretty much all the online um, retailers sell it. Uh, just Google Cantillon's Casual Commentary and you can get it. Yeah, and we, we also do a program called Jim Cantillon yeah. Today, produced by Ryan. Yeah. And uh, Corey will be back uh, in the new year, but uh, we are glad that you're here, Jim. Well, I'm, I'm so glad. And by the way, not that I want to, you know, gild the lily, but Ryan is a terrific producer director. You should be proud of him. I think I you are. I am very proud of him, yeah. <laughs> well, I, I just love, I love it because I get to learn all about uh, what you're teaching. Well, it so. seems to me that if anybody should know the scripture, it's you. I mean, you, <laughs> I mean I'm listening, you know, in rapt attention to your commentaries. <laughs> yeah, that's really true. Well, anyway, so that's good. You're going to stay with us yeah. for another yeah. uh, couple of days till yeah. we're done uh, sure. this taping. But uh, it's important for you to stay in the Word of God, stay in the Bible, because he's talking to you. Question is, are you listening? I want to remind you that we have a prayer meeting on Facebook and YouTube and Bible Discovery TV Monday, Wednesday, and Friday at 3.30 p.m. We'll pray for your needs. Make sure that's 3.30 p.m. Eastern time and make sure you join us. I'd love to pray for you. But today let's pray. And as we speak, let's say it this way. Father, I need you to help me build your kingdom and not my own. Your will be done and your kingdom come.